session. Yes. Not, Today? Not an autobiography. Correct. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I know. I understand. Uh, today is April 29th, 2008. My name is Rosalind Benjet. We are here today in the home of Dr. Julius Wolfram uh, to take his oral history. Um, the interviewer will be Rosalind Benjet, and the videographer is Ruth Andrus. Dr. Wolfram, tell me about your family. Uh, my wife and I were married in 1942 after. World War II had started, and... Uh, Here in Dallas? No, in Newport News, Virginia, her home. Mm -hmm. I'm originally from New York City, mm -hmm. and we met down there in Virginia, and we married after knowing each other a uh, year and some months. <coughs> Pardon me. And we first came down here uh, while I was in the Army as a physician. I was stationed first up outside of Detroit, Michigan, a place which is now the Wayne County Airport. And one afternoon, I got a call from the adjutant of the post. He said, you're being uh, transferred down to a comparable post in Dallas, Texas. And I would like to uh, help you get settled down there, perhaps give you some letters of introduction. His name was Ed Marcus. He was Stanley Marcus's brother. Uh, he had been ill with pneumonia, I think it was, and I took care of him in the hospital at the airfield there. I got to know him a little bit, and he gave us letters of introduction to, uh, what's his name, oh, Rabbi Lefkowitz's son, and we became good friends with our family. Uh, I was stationed here at, at Love Field, which was then the Army Air Corps uh, post. We established our first home in the fall of 1946 on, over on uh, Southwestern Boulevard. And we have three sons, two of whom were born here. The oldest was born in Newport News, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Okay, before we go ahead, let's go back for a while um, about your parents. Where were, were they, they were living in New York when you were born? Yes. Uh, my father had been born in Austria, mm -hmm. going down to Vienna to go to school, to go to college, and hopefully medical school. And he was denied admission because, basically because he was Jewish. but. Uh, legally, because he didn't have the requisite papers. He had been born up in the mountains between uh, Austria and uh, what was then uh, German controlled by Bohemia, mm -hmm. Sudetenland. Pardon me. <clears throat> and uh, his father had gone down to Vienna in the middle of the 19th century when. Oh, when so many other young men congregated in Vienna and tried to establish a democratic government. And the emperor's prime minister was very rigid, very strict, pardon me. <coughs> and that was the reason that so many of them emigrated to the United States, establishing homes in, in Milwaukee, Minneapolis, St. Louis, and South Texas. <coughs> My grandfather chose to go back into the mountains, and uh, that was where my father was born. <coughs> my mother was born in Philadelphia of Russian Jewish parents, and she and my father met when he came to the United States and worked in New York City. <coughs> 
he worked as a shipping clerk in a, in a department store and learned English that way, then worked and put himself through pharmacy school. <coughs> Damn. I think she went to get some. And then opened up a drugstore in Brooklyn, New York. And I was born a block away from that drugstore between Kings County, halfway between Kings County Hospital and Prospect Park. Mm -hmm. And then, pardon me, <coughs> and then he moved his store out to Richmond Hill in Queens, which we followed. <coughs> Damn, this is all taking, isn't it? And I went to start in elementary school there, and we lived in a, a two-story house. And I remember, at least I, th I suppose I remember, going to the Armistice Day Parade, oh thank you very much, on the main street in Richmond Hill when World War I ended. When he moved to New York City, he established a drugstore at the corner of 144th Street and Amsterdam Avenue in Upper Manhattan. Ran that for a while, and we lived up in, upstairs in the apartment house. And then he moved his store over to 142nd Street, 140th Street, and Amsterdam, near right across the street from City College. And we lived in an apartment house a block and a half away. Mm -hmm. And where did you go to school? And my high school was Townsend Harris Hall, which was on the campus of the City College of New York. Mm -hmm. It was a three-year school, and you had to get in by, you had to be admitted by, I don't remember, special examination or recommendation. But it was not part of the Board of Education of New York. It was a separate entity, Run part, by the, part the of the College, Board of Higher, or the Council or something or other, of Higher Education, which included the City College of New York and Hunter College. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I graduated from there in the usual three years. And, instead of the four years in the regular high schools. And I was admitted to a Columbia College of the University of the Columbia University of New York. I graduated from there in four years. And what did you study in, in college? I took the usual pre medical courses and also so you were already interested in medicine. I was interested. I became interested in medicine in the ninth grade. <laughs> now let me see how did that happen. When we first started doing some dissection of frogs or something mm -hmm. like that in biology, mm. and I'm sure that my father's history and interest and in his profession influenced me. <clears throat> I remember my father, I remember that my mother wanted me to become a dentist because she, she said they have an easier life and they make a lot of money. <laughs> but I wasn't interested in dentistry and I, uh, I did fairly well in college. And then went to medical school also fairly close to our home. <coughs> we lived in the same apartment house that we lived in while I was in high school because that was only a block and a half or two blocks away from school. And he used to walk up to, or I could get the subway up to 168th Street and Broadway where uh, 
the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Columbia University was located. And uh, I had my four-year graduation there and interned in a place called Lincoln Hospital in the Southeast Bronx. And that was of interest particularly because it was also a school for African-American nurses that had been established soon after uh, the, the end of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. But the hospital grew up and it was, a, it was a municipal hospital, very busy. And after the terminate the end of my internship, my two year internship, that was what was usual at that time. <clears throat> I worked for a year as a fellow in pathology at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, where I had the pleasure of working under and meeting the great Dr. Paul Klempera, one of the outstanding pathologists in that part of the, in that part of, in that time. What year would this have been approximately? I graduated from medical school in 1942. So this was a few, no, no, 19, correction. Graduated from medical school in 1936. Mm -hmm. 1942 is the year of my marriage, but 1936. And of course the troubles with the Nazis in Germany had already started. And Dr. Klemper used to disappear from the hospital and from the laboratory so many days and we learned, with the, those of us who worked there, learned that he had been going down to the docks in New York City and welcoming and vouching for Austrian and German physicians and other scientists because at that time you could not get into the United States from one of the Central European countries unless someone would vouch and state that you would not become a financial burden. <clears throat> and here, all of these things arranged. He was a great man. He was a humanitarian as well as a great physician. Now, Mount Sinai, though, was a Jewish hospital, correct? Mount Sinai was a Jewish hospital, yes. What was it like being a Jewish doctor in those days when not all hospitals accepted Jewish doctors on their staff? Well, that's a little bit of a fairy tale. Is it? Yes. There were, of course, Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. There was no problem about it. Right. But in the Lenox Hill Hospital in New York City, uh, an excellent hospital, uh, this had also been established by German Jews earlier, mm -hmm. and there was no problem whatsoever. And some famous surgeons uh, had worked there. One of the early thoracic surgeons established the Department of Thoracic Surgery there. And there was another Jewish hospital downtown, uh, Beth Israel. I'm not sure. I'm not sure of the name anymore. And there was a Brooklyn Jewish hospital. Mm -hmm. But there were certainly there were Jewish physicians on the staff of Presbyterian Hospital, which was the hospital for my medical school, for the Columbia Medical School, on the staff and on the faculty and also practitioners. Uh, about, mm, about perhaps 20% of my medical school class was Jewish. And there was no question about discrimination there. These, these people were just ordinary guys who applied, mm -hmm. who didn't have any pull or anything like that. We were just accepted. Uh, I don't know how it was elsewhere, but uh, to jump ahead, when we came down here to Dallas, uh, 
I found that in time, perhaps not at the initial time, that the chief of ear, nose, and throat at Bear La Hospital was a well-known Jewish physician, Lyle Sellers. And he did great things for Baylor Hospital. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to Jewish affiliations during your childhood. Um, how did your family celebrate Jewish holidays? Uh, well, mostly in a negative sense. The things they didn't do. We didn't have Christmas tree and we didn't celebrate Christmas or Easter. We bought Christmas presents mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was I had a bar mitzvah in a reformed Jewish congregation on the Upper West Side of Manhattan mm -hmm. but I must admit after I was through with bar, my bar mitzvah I didn't have much Jewish activity really at all until I met my future wife mm -hmm. and started attending services in their uh, um, conservative congregation mm -hmm. in Newport News. And she was from Newport News? Newport News, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Her family had been there for quite a few years and she had a big family there with many, many, I think at one time she had 30 or 40 first cousins all living in Newport News, Virginia. Uh, to jump... How did you meet? To jump back, yes, mm -hmm. I will do that. Uh, when I got through with my internship, uh, Dr. Klemper said he would try to get me, uh, he would get me a position in doing research with one of the other people in, in Mount Sinai Hospital. When I was in medical school, I had done a little bit of research on the adrenal cortex uh, gland extract and anaphylactic shock in guinea pigs and wrote a paper which was published. Uh, after my uh, internship and after I got through with uh, the residency, the, uh, the fellowship rather, at Mount Sinai, uh, I had a two-year uh, residency in internal medicine at Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx. Montefiore is an Italian translation of Goldberg and it was called Montefiore because it had been established through the uh, philanthropy of Sir Moses Montefiore of England mm -hmm. and it became known as a hospital for chronic diseases. It was an opportunity for intense study of any particular subject, of any, of every uh, uh, person who was admitted to the hospital. And there were some famous physicians on the staff. But at the same time, it was easygoing. It was pleasant. <laughs> there were tennis courts on the grounds and it was pretty routine after the evening meal to go out and play tennis at the appropriate time of the year. Mm -hmm. And there was the midnight suppers being served also. And we had quarters there. We lived on the, on the hospital grounds. And it was obvious at that time that uh, the war was coming on, World War II. Mm -hmm. My father had become ill while I was in medical school uh, with kidney involvement, and I was looking for something to do that would keep me fairly close to home because I didn't know what my father's illness would do to him eventually. And I wanted to be fairly near to my mother. So I investigated uh, group practices in the neighborhood of New York City and found one down in New Jersey in Bound Brook, New Jersey. And I interviewed with them and 
However, I wasn't entirely taken with that group and I uh, applied for a position with the Veterans Administration Hospital System because I knew that there was fairly study, steady and that I'd be paid something that was probably going to be necessary to support my mother because I didn't know how long my father was going to live. And they first, uh, they had, they uh, gave me an assignment in uh, Hampton, Virginia. But it was going to start for about six months. So in the interval, I applied for and received a position in the Civilian Conservation Corps, one of President Roosevelt's babies. Mm -hmm. And this was to help youth, help young men uh, do some uh, worthwhile work and keep them out of trouble. And so they sent me down to Chattanooga, Tennessee to uh, get oriented to the uh, life of the Civilian Conservation Corps. It was my first trip outside of New York, down south of, south of New York City, south of Philadelphia actually. And after a short time there, they stationed me up in East Tennessee, somewhere near Johnson City. I was there for a while. And what were your duties there? I was a camp physician. I mm -hmm. took care of the young men, mostly giving, giving in typhoid shots and keeping them out of trouble and treating bone nucleosis and respiratory infections, minor mm -hmm. stuff. And that didn't look like anything particularly exciting. Then they sent me down to my, my, my Veterans Administration uh, position uh, became established and they sent me first to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to get oriented to the VA system and then to the hospital in uh, Kikatan, Virginia, which was right near the city of Hampton and the city of Newport News. And it was there at a young Jewish women's organization party that I met my wife, Rhea Wolfram. And she was a lively young lady, a teacher, a terrific dancer and very active in the entertainment of the young men who were stationed at the military establishments nearby because that was part of the thing to do at that time. I became, I should say, almost integrated into her family I took frequent trips between the VA hospital and her home coming back at midnight on the trolley car. And eventually she suggested that we that I buy a car and she got one for me through one of her friends and actually she taught me to drive. I was very well satisfied that this was the girl I was going to marry after a very few dates. And I think that perhaps she decided that also. And we, we didn't really decide on a wedding date at that time. One of the things I remember that we did together, we drove up to Richmond, Virginia, to see a Metropolitan Opera performance of La Boheme, the first opera that she had seen. Mm -hmm. And of course it's everybody's favorite, it's still her favorite and mine. And then she also drove me up at a later date to Richmond to take the train up to New York 
because I had received a call from my brother that my father was dying and I ought to get up there in a hurry. And I got up to, to the apartment just in time to see him dying. Went back to Newport News and said, what can we do now? We're, this, is, this changes the situation. And I remember my father-in-law telling me that one does not put off happy events because of a sad event. And so we got married in June. June of 1942. And we honeymooned very briefly up at the Williamsburg Inn Williamsburg, Virginia, historic area. And then uh, we went up to Bound Brook where I had joined that group that I mentioned earlier. It was not a particularly desirable position, I thought, but again, I thought it would keep me new in the New York City and my widowed mother for a while before getting into the service, as I thoroughly expected to. We lived in an apartment there and rather enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. An interesting sidelight, my wife got a job with the government at a location somewhere east of where we lived, south and east of where we lived, and she had to, in part one of her duties was to be a courier taking material up to some place in New York City about the Manhattan Project. Well, of, course, of course, the Manhattan Project, she was going up to Manhattan, that seemed normal. We never, got, never, never gave that another thought. But I decided I wasn't going to stay down there in New Jersey very long. I wasn't very happy with it, and I knew I was going to get into the Army. I didn't want to be drafted, so I volunteered. We spent a few happy days in New York City. I remember that we saw Man of La Mancha, the great musical show about Don Quixote, down in, the, down in Greenwich Village. And then I received my assignment and uh, they sent me up to an airfield, an Army Air Corps post called Romulus, Michigan, outside of Detroit. And it, it was there that I took care of, I did mention Ed Marcus already, did I not? I took care of him in the hospital. And he called me up one day to tell me about being transferred down to Dallas. And I remember I called up my wife, who was working at the Judge Advocate General School in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where we lived, and told her about Dallas. And she said, oh, no, me, Neiman Marcus, Neiman Marcus, <laughs> which didn't mean a thing to me, except I knew that that was owned by the family of Ed Marcus, whom I had met, who was the adjutant. I'm getting rather completely biographical now. Mm -hmm. This is not oral history. So you uh, arrived in Dallas in 1946, you said? So we had received this assignment to come down to Dallas. We lived in an apartment for a while. And I worked at Love Field, which was in an Army Air Corps post. And then along came VE Day, the day of victory in Europe, and everything changed. The orientation was for Japan. I was transferred from this post down here to the School of Tropical Medicine in Washington, D.C., at Walter Reed Hospital had a wonderful experience down there, learned a lot, and I asked where I was going to be sent 
after that. And I thought I was going to the South Pacific, having learned tropical diseases. But they transferred me back up to Romulus Army Airport again. And we again lived in Ann Arbor, Michigan. My wife was having some problems with dental infection and also urinary tract infection. And they said that she ought to go back to live with her parents in New York City because you couldn't guarantee that she was going to be taken care of because of infection. We had so little to treat with at that time. So she went back up to New York City, up, up to Newport News, Virginia, to live with her parents for a while while she was in her, in her first pregnancy. And I stayed up there at the Army Air Corps post. Then I, in November 1945, I got a call from my mother-in-law while I was in the Army Air Corps, in the medical barracks there, saying, Rhea just gave birth to a beautiful little boy. And that was November 1945. And so, of course, I raced down there pretty soon mm -hmm. for the Briss. I'm not sure I made it for the Briss, but anyway, I got down there. And then I went back up and the war was wearing down. I think VJ Day occurred while I was back up there. And they wanted to keep all of the doctors in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the army. So they said, where would you like, you gonna, you can't get out yet, but where would you like to be transferred to next? So I said, Dallas, Texas, there was a fifth ferrying group down here. There had been third ferrying group up and out, up outside of Detroit. So I came down here and presided over the closing of the hospital at the Medical Corps Hospital at Love Field. Mm -hmm. And Rhea came down I'm not sure of the timing of all of this now. But again, she became pregnant. Or rather, no, the first time was this, the first pregnancy. And she went back up to uh, Virginia to live with her parents for a while because, again, my status was not definite. But I got out of the army, I made arrangements to buy a little house, a so-called GI house, on Morningside, no, I forget, oh good lord, I forget the street, Southwestern Boulevard. Hmm. Which was where? Pardon? Was that University Park at that time? No, this was north of University Park. It was just west of the Cotton Belt, Cotton Belt Railroad. Mm -hmm. And I remember my wife, Rhea, flew down here from Newport News, Virginia, and her plane had to return to Washington Airport twice so that she was expected down here early in the afternoon, but she arrived around 10 p.m. or so at night. That was when I first saw my first son standing up, a little 10-month-old baby, standing up next to his mother while she telephoned her mother to say that, that she'd arrived. What, we, was, what was Dallas like at that time? Dallas ended at, at Lover's Lane. There really wasn't much north of that, except for very few 
uh, big homes uh, belonging to, among others, prominent Jewish people, who were, most of whom were associated with the Pollock Paper Company. We became acquainted with a, a number of people and uh, were invited to the Colombian club, to join the Colombian club and to go out and visit there. There was a social club that was then out on Garland Road. And we were also invited to uh, join outings uh, in this group of uh, homes in the northern part of the city, north of Northwest Highway. They're owned by Jewish people. So we made many friends there. Originally, when we were stationed down here, when I was stationed down here, we attended High Holy Services, High Holy Day Services, at uh, Congregation Sheriff Israel, which was then down on somewhere south of the main part of town. And that when we no, let me, let me review and go back. I had received letters of introduction from uh, the adjutant, Ed Marcus, when I was transferred down here the first time, introducing me, letters of introduction, to Rabbi David Lefkowitz's son and his family, and also to several members of the staff of the Neiman Marcus store. When we did come back and live, my wife became very ill with lower urinary tract infections and also a kidney stones and uremia and a bloodstream infection. And at one time, she was not expected to live. Penicillin was available, but it was not available to uh, civilian uh, patients, no, 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 no. It's and I remember very well standing outside her room and the doctors taking care of her saying she has a bloodstream infection. Does Wolfram know how bad it is? And the other saying yes, of course he does. And we were talking about what possibly could be done to save her life. A new drug had just been, had just come into view, streptomycin. And it was thought to have the potential for controlling the kind of infection, the bloodstream infection that she had, which surely would have killed her. We called the drugstores, the doctors called the drugstores, and I called the drugstores around town. Nobody had it. It was available only to military personnel up at the VA hospital in McKinney, Texas, and also the other VA hospital in downtown Dallas, way across, in, uh, way across Oak Cliff. Desperately, we called there and I guess I must have sounded very pitiful. And the officer, that day, the doctor down there said, when we asked him, yes, he could give us streptomycin. So I raced down there across town. I don't know how I managed to find the VA hospital, but came back up with the streptomycin. Her fever came down, the bloodstream infection was controlled but she was still ill and weak. We lived in that little house on, on Southwestern Boulevard. There was, big que there was a great question as to whether or not she could become pregnant again because of the urinary tract infections that she continued to have. 
but a new drug came on the market, sulfathalidine, and the urologist who had helped to take care of her said that if she took that for several months and she managed to do fairly well, that it would be safe to try for another pregnancy. Our second son was born here in Dallas at the Florence Nightingale Hospital, which was a little maternity hospital on the campus of the Valley University Medical Center. And I remember he was born and we came home and we enclosed the little porch on the side of that two-bedroom house that we had on mm -hmm. uh, West Southwestern Boulevard to make a nursery and a bedroom for him. And I remember my mother-in-law came down and visited. She was ill, very ill, with rheumatic heart disease and diabetes. And she never took care of herself. And when when she was at the point of death, I remember that one of the members of the family called and said, Come, see what you can do. Maybe you can do something more. And she was in the hospital, and I remember she died a few days after I was there. And then sometime after that, my wife returned to Newport News to take care of her father who was also ill with diabetes and was getting weaker. I stayed here and opened my practice. So you went into when private I was practice? At Love, when I was at Love, we first came down here uh, in the Army Station in the Army. I met several Jewish physicians and one of them was an internist. And he uh, learned that I was interested in internal medicine. He said, come to Medical Grand Rounds. We have Medical Grand Rounds at the different hospitals on Sunday mornings. And it was then that I met Dr. Tinsley Harrison, who was the professor of medicine and dean of the medical school, the new medical school, which had just been started. There had been a Baylor Medical College here stationed at Baylor Hospital, but that moved down to uh, Houston mm -hmm. and the new Southwestern Medical Foundation Medical School was established in the old Parkland Hospital and in uh, Army Barracks that or on the grounds. I don't remember why they were there. And when I met Dr. Harrison, and he called me by name, by first name, having known me when I was in my second year of residency up at Montefiore in New York, I was hooked on, on, on Dallas. <laughs> and we had enjoyed Dallas when we were here. We learned that it had a symphony orchestra during peace times, it had a public library, it had an art museum, and there were various other cultural activities, and we liked the people we met, and we decided we were going to live here. And that's how it came about that I asked to be transferred back here. Mm -hmm. And I bought that little house on Southwestern Boulevard and my wife, Rhea, came down to join me when our son, Michael, was 10 months old. I'm repeating myself, I know. Now, your children then grew up? Um, our children all grew up here. in Dallas. 
they were, we joined Temple Emmanuel, where we greatly appreciated Rabbi Lefkowitz. And how do you think the city has changed since then? The population, of course, has increased greatly, and the Jewish population also increased greatly after World War II. It was a mixed group that came down, people from the New York area, people from the Midwest, Chicago and Minneapolis and Cleveland, and uh, it was, we became acquainted with the uh, man who was the, what was he, name was, I forget the name, but he was the, the director of the Jewish Federation, the Jewish Welfare Federation of Dallas. And of course, I made a contribution to that. I remember while I was still in the army, when I knew I was going to live here. And also, we knew several other people who were active in, in Jewish social welfare activities. We got to be very close with a number of them. Okay. And you went into private practice. I, 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 did, I did mention that I yes. had been stationed at Love Field. Yes. And while I was there, several Jewish physicians in town learned that I was there, that I was interested in going into practice. And they had an office on Fairmount Street downtown, mm -hmm. a little building. And they offered me a space. They said if I wanted to go into practice, they had room there for me. And I did. I accepted the offer. And practiced there for, I forget, several years, I think. And then I moved over to the section near Barla Hospital. where, pardon me for stalling, where offices had been built and I took an office nearby there, near Bela Hospital. Now remember, I, re I remember looking out of the back window of that office one day and watching a tornado come straight up Inwood Road from Oak Cliff, fairly near to our house. By that time, our, our oldest son was about 10 or 11 years old, and he was playing at Sunlight's house, not far from where we were living. And I had the horrors. I drove home and picked him up, but he was safe. I didn't mention him. I've been. I've skipped a good deal. After we lived in that little house on Southwestern Boulevard, we looked for another home because it was getting too small, much too tight for us, and. We bought a house on Edlin Road, which was north of Northwest Highway. Mm -hmm. And one little amusing incident about that, and it's relevant. Rhea's relatives in New York, and in, in Virginia rather, were dog lovers. And they sent us, when we first moved in, up on Southwestern Boulevard a beautiful little white and tan puppy and she grew up with our boys our 
third son, Richard, was also born in Florence Nightingale Hospital. I'll never forget, I didn't witness his delivery there because I was over in the main hospital pulling fluid out of a woman's chest, doing a chest aspiration. It was necessary for an elderly lady who was very short of breath because of the fluid. And I remember after I got her straightened out, I raced back over. And Rhea was very apprehensive about vision because her older brother, Jesse, had been born blind. So she was also always concerned with all three children. Mm -hmm. Is their vision all right? And it was obvious that they followed hands and appropriately they, they looked and they saw. So that was great. Now, um... All three children went to religious school at Temple Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. We had moved into the house up on Edland Road after a few years for the one on Southwestern Boulevard. And um, are you still practicing today or are you doing research? I had my office open until the fall of 1990 mm -hmm. and practiced Baylor Hospital almost until that time. And I was asked in my second year here when I had been, after having been an instructor at the Southwestern Medical School Mm -hmm. over in those barrack-like buildings near Parkland Hospital. I was asked to teach the second year course in physical medicine at the medical school. Physical medicine is listening, looking, hearing, touching, and so on. The second year course. And I gave the lectures there. The faculty at that time consisted only of Dr. Tinsley Harris and the man that I'd mentioned before, and a well-known researcher, Arthur Grohlman, originally from Hopkins Medical School. That was the reason that I was asked to give that second year course. Very soon thereafter, uh, the faculty increased and my connection with the medical school just became that of an instructor uh, seeing people in the clinic. Mm -hmm. Now tell me about your family today. Your sons all live in Dallas? No, we're, I've been concentrating on me, haven't I? And my oldest son, we lived up on Edlin Road, which I said was north of uh, Northwest Highway. Oh, I forgot to mention, I mentioned the dog that was sent to us. When we moved from Southwestern Boulevard to, uh, to Edlin Road, we took the dog with us, of course. And when we got up in the morning, she wasn't there. So we drove around looking for her, went back to the old house on Southwestern Boulevard. Sure enough, she had found her way back there. <laughs> So we brought her up to Edlin Road, and she never wandered away again. She was a beautiful dog, and really, the children all grew up with her dog, with, with their dog, with Sissy. Now, we forgot to ask what year you were born. Pardon? What year were you born? I'm sorry, I didn't What know. year were you born? I was born on July 25th, 1912. Mm -hmm. 
in uh, in New York. Mm -hmm. And um, do you have grandchildren? No. Well, yes, of course I have grandchildren. <laughs> I've, I've, I, that no no came out automatically. I was thinking of males, since all my children were males. Right. But a first son married, and he married a girl from. No, that we're jumping ahead of myself again. Our children went, started in school, in grade school, at the Pershing Elementary School, which was a new school with a wonderful new principal. And it was just like having them in private school. There was so much attention given to them. We got to know all the members of the PTA, mm -hmm. and we took an active role in what was happening at the school. And when our oldest son uh, entered junior high school, he went to the one over on uh, Hillcrest Road, right near the new Hillcrest High School. And he was pretty good in school. And when uh, the teacher gave an assignment, and asked about uh, coronary thrombosis and said that was a stroke. My son piped up and said, no, 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 my father's a, an internist and cardiologist and, and that's a heart attack. Cerebral, I mean, car, coronary thrombosis is a heart attack. And the teacher said, well, in my class, that's going to be a stroke. <laughs> My son came back home and told me about that, and we laughed and we thought that was so ridiculous. And meanwhile, we had been thinking about his going to St. Mark's School, and that was the finishing touches. So he entered St. Mark's School, private school. And I don't remember what grade he entered in. He entered as a, as a freshman in high school. And pretty soon, my second son, Stephen, who had been going to elementary school, the Pershing Elementary School, was told by his teacher there, you ought not to go to the high school, the Hillcrest High School. You ought to go to St. Mark's. So eventually, all three of our sons, eventually Richard also went to St. Mark's at a younger grade. Mike was admitted to, the oldest son, was admitted to Harvard when the admissions officer at Harvard came down to visit St. Mark's. Nowadays, you have to have, go through all sorts of application forms and so on to get into college. He was admitted to college when the admissions officer for Harvard walked across the campus with my son, with Mike, and the headmaster. And the headmaster said, here's our best merchandise for Harvard. <laughs> and he said, I agree, and he took him. And when he started in, he wanted to become a doctor, but he decided that it was too much. He didn't want to spend so much time in the laboratory. He wanted to be with people. So he changed to become a law student. And while he was up there at summer school, he met his future wife, who was from Waltham, Massachusetts, right near Harvard. Steve went to Harvard, and then Richard went to Trinity College in Harvard, Connecticut. So we've had our connection with the Northeast all along. But they all came back to live in Dallas? None of them. None of them. None of them came back to live in Dallas. <laughs> they all think that their home is Dallas.
but Michael, the oldest, now lives out in California. Steve, the second one, who married and had three and had four children, now lives in Paris. And Richard, the youngest, also married, now lives up in Old Greenwich, Connecticut. They're all lawyers. They all thought about becoming physicians. Thought pretty seriously, I believe. Okay. That's it. Yeah.